going into open session now, and our members. Um, I'm sure you're aware Michael Copeland uh, has now resigned from the Assembly um, uh, due to, to personal uh, issues. Um, and of course, he, he wasn't able to attend very much uh, at committee, but would we be content that I write on behalf of the committee anyway to convey our, our best wishes? Apologies, uh, Stephen Moutry and Jimmy Spratt, I think, will be joining us later on. Any other? No? Okay. Now, I also stand, understand, Bronwyn, this is, this is your last? Mm, yes, Okay, moving to the Justice Committee. Um, I'd like to put uh, on record uh, my thanks for your contributions. They've clearly been, as well as the general interest, specific areas that you have uh, highlighted relentlessly and admirably. So we wish you well with uh, you. bringing the same skills to, to the Justice Committee. Uh, members, now, page 23, an invitation for the All Party Group on Women, Peace and Security. Uh, it's the launch of their gender principles for dealing with the legacy of the past. It's uh, Tuesday coming at half past ten in room 115. Uh, at page 24, there's an invitation for Amnesty International, Committee on the Administration of Justice. Queen's and Ulster University, uh, and that's for another publication. It's a report and draft model bill in relation to dealing with the past as outlined in the Stormont House Agreement. It's scheduled for Wednesday the 16th. It's in the Connor Lecture Room at the York Street campus uh, of Ulster University. At page 13 of Tabled, there's an invitation from the Northern Ireland Human Rights Commission. Uh, that's for their strategic plan consultation events. Uh, held on Monday the 21st and Wednesday the 23rd of this month. Please reply directly. Uh, as you're aware, the chairs of the relevant committees dealing with the European issues across uh, the devolved legislatures and also the Commons and the Lords uh, meet once or twice a year under the auspices of what's called ECUK. Uh, it's our turn as an assembly to host the next meeting. Provisional arrangements are being put in place to have it here on the 27th of November. Uh, I must ask, are members content that this committee sponsors the ECUK meeting uh, in November? Yeah, thank you. And a list of committee's uh, current invitations is at page 26. In the absence of comment on that, can I turn your attention to the draft minutes of our meeting of the 1st of July uh, on page 29 of the meeting pack? Members content? Uh, last week, as I said, the papers from the event organised by the Equality Commission uh, on the consultation on proposals for age discrimination legislation, which took place at the end of August, uh, are now available in your packs from page 38. Uh, and at page 87 is the list of outstanding correspondence. Uh, in the absence of that, I draw your attention to the summary sheet at page 90 of correspondence received since we last met. met. Uh, and if there's uh, no matter a member wishes to raise about that correspondence, we'll go on to the draft forward work programme, page 106 of the PACs. Uh, you'll see a briefing on October monitoring has been scheduled for the 30th of September, but at official level, uh, we've been advised the October monitoring will not be taking place and that briefing will be removed from the work programme. Uh, at our last meeting, it was also suggested we invite the new Commissioner for Victims and Survivors uh, to brief us. Uh, the Commissioner has indicated availability on the 21st of October, so can I suggest we invite the Victims and Survivors Service to brief the Committee and to provide us with an update on their work uh, before the Commissioner appears. So perhaps get the, the service uh, on the 7th of October. Any other comments, Members? Now, members, I'm afraid I have to leave, and we uh, had alerted the Vice Chair uh, that he was expected to take the chair, but he is not here. Could I make a proposal? I'm just going to throw this out, um, as it is Bronwyn's last. Don't take that in No? OK, OK. I'll second it. I, um, <laughs> second. <laughs> Ronald, it's two, it's two departmental evidence sessions. No, oh, just leave no. me. Okay. Thank well, you, Chair. Any, any other proposal for who will take the chair? I can't. I have to leave at 3.30, so... Am I also to leave at 3? I go on. Well, I'm on the course. I have to be aware of it as well. Stephen's 
Stephen's going to talk about this. Megan, would you would you take the chair even until Stephen arrives? If he's, if he's Chris, 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 Ch
15, 16 priorities that are in front of the committee in draft and which you'll have had the chance to consider. Uh, we've taken a slightly different approach with those this year. They were already partly drafted when I arrived in post and I sought to in inject a little bit of change but if I tried to inject too much change I was concerned that it would have caused a lot of delay because there are so many departments involved in the, in the exercise. But you will see that I have tried to put the focus on four uh, quadrants, four er areas as it were, where I think it's important for us to work. The first is the whole er issue of collaboration. Uh, collaboration is really right at the heart of everything that we try to do in relation to Europe and when we don't collaborate well uh, we, we, we're not as successful. There is a huge uh, issue of collective responsibility at work in, in relation to the European agenda and trying to make the most of uh, the, the, uh, the opportunities and indeed tackle the threats that arise at a European level. The second area that I wanted to have a focus on is capacity building. Uh, we have some departments in Northern Ireland that are enormously <coughs> capable in terms of their engagement with European uh, affairs and, and other stakeholders as well who engage very effectively in Europe. Um, and of course there are areas of departments where people have very little contact with Europe and we need to continue to work at that to make sure that we have a team of people uh, who are very effective at uh, making the most of the European opportunity. Um, there are major opportunities in a, in a Brussels context in particular to learn from others and to see the best of what is happening across the European Union in different areas and to, and to see what we, the vision we can obtain for ourselves from that and that's certainly a priority that I would want to see going forward. And we also have an opportunity to allow others to learn from us because there are many areas where actually this region uh, does things rather well and we do showcase uh, on a fairly regular basis some of those things uh, in Europe and uh, that, that engagement is extremely valuable to us. Right through those four quadrants uh, is the issue of the quality of the engagement uh, and certainly you know, in, in terms of my advice to ministers I will be putting an emphasis on that issue that we need to engage with each other and with Europe and, and uh, it's not about the quantity, it's about the quality. Um, in terms of what we've been up to, I mean, in the, in the last year since I've been there, certainly we've had two uh, commissioners visit Northern Ireland, Commissioner Hogan uh, from Agriculture and Commissioner Katainen in relation to strategic investment, and those were very important um, and, and uh, valuable engagements that happened when involving a number of ministers from the executive. We had also planned to have the Regional Development Commissioner, Commissioner Kretsu, uh, visit us uh, at the beginning of July. Uh, and at, the, uh, at fairly short notice that that visit didn't take place. I'm extremely hopeful that we'll be able to work on that issue and have her come and visit us uh, again in the not too distant future as there are some uh, announcements that we'd quite like her to make. Uh, and it'd be quite good if she could announce them here. Um, in terms of ministerial visits to Brussels, uh, certainly in, in my time, and that's since March, we've seen Danny Kennedy, Michelle O'Neill, Jonathan Bell, Jennifer McCann and Simon Hamilton in the Brussels office and, and doing, carrying out a range of um, activities at, in Brussels. Um, and uh, it's been extremely helpful to us to have that level of minister, ministerial attention. Apart from anything else, knowing in advance that a minister is coming over, it's sometimes possible to get that minister to do something that draws, you know, creates an, in, an increased um, uh, focus and, and, and is extremely valuable in an engaging at the Brussels level. Um, I, um, we have published a, a Brussels office report, which I think is with the committee now. And uh, that has been, uh, I think, will hopefully be quickly circulated to the other committees of the Assembly. Um, I engaged recently with ministers in OFMDFM to ask them if I could please send my report direct to other ministers, because I realised other ministers don't, don't routinely receive the Brussels report. And they've agreed to that. So I'm, I'm planning to just issue reports in future to all ministers. I think it's important that all ministers are together and are on the same page, as it were, in terms of what they see from, from the Brussels office. If the committee was willing and if the systems were to allow me, I'd really rather like to apply that approach to the committees as well and just issue it to everyone. But I'm very much in the hands of the committee on that, and I wouldn't want to, um, I, I, I wouldn't want to force you down a path that, that you weren't comfortable in going. Are you aware of any rules that prevent you doing that? 
I think it's just a process thing, really, as much as anything else. That you're the lead committee in relation to this topic, and therefore right. we out of protocol. You know, protocol. We just send it to you, and then it's issued. But Disperse. it just means that it's extremely then slow in getting to the others. And I think, okay. in parallel with sending it to all ministers, I think we really rather good if we could just send it out to all the committee chairs or to the committees. Okay. Yeah. Um, in terms of um, the, the pace with which we process. Um, reports and, and the, the setting up of new priorities and so on is an issue of concern and has been repeatedly an issue of concern for the committee, I know from reading previous Hansard reports and so on. Um, the, the, the barriers to, to improving that are, are, are not small and it will take me a little bit of time to work on that issue. The closest parallel I can find is that in my last posting I was in um, the Department of Agriculture, where the committee had enormous concerns about the pace of payments to farmers, and I discovered that it was extremely hard to get that accelerated. Given time and, and, uh, and energy and so on, we did turn that around. This is probably even harder to turn around because the, 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 the barriers are human more than IT, um, but we'll, we'll, we'll work hard on that, and I think with, 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 with goodwill and, and really good collaboration and engagement with other departments, I would hope that we can make improvements in that going forward. Um, but it is a challenge, and it's a challenge just simply because there are so many different people contributing at different levels to the final agreement that everything has been verified and agreed and is ready to, ready to issue. Um, in terms of where we're at in Brussels at the moment, we uh, are awaiting obviously the next Commission work plan, for, uh, which will be coming out in October or November time in relation to the, the following year. But just uh, today we had the State of the Union speech from Commissioner Juncker, the, uh, sorry, from President Juncker, the President of the Commission, which gives you a real indication of where the focus of the Commission and the European institutions is at at the moment. He spoke for an awful lot of the time about the refugee issue. Um, and he then went on to talk about Greece, the Euro and the EU economy in general. He talked uh, in the third area, he spoke about, about a fairer deal for Britain and how that needed to be accompanied by a fairer deal for all the other member states as well. Uh, he spoke about Ukraine and he spoke about climate change. Those were his key issues. He then went on to say that he wasn't going to talk about, and in doing so talked about, the Cyprus peace deal and farmers and milk. Um, so those are the kinds of things we're keeping an issue on in terms of the broad spectrum, but within that we try to keep very focused on what are the priorities for departments here, priorities for ministers here, and make sure we provide as much support uh, in, in helping advance those priorities as we possibly can. <coughs> Happy to, to, to take questions, Chair. Okay. Thank you, Andrew. Um, uh, apologies for my lateness today, and thank you for your, your presentation. I um, certainly look forward to working with you on an ongoing basis. Um, and you'll be aware that the committee takes seriously its portfolio to scrutinise and support the work of the executive in relation to European issues. Um, you, you you touched on um, the, uh, the the report in relation to 2014-15 priorities. Um, obviously, a key recommendation from the committee report on the inquiry into the Barroso task force was that the executive publish its annual European priorities document in a more timely fashion, and certainly within the first quarter of the respective year. So I know you've touched on that, but can you give us any more detail as to why there is such a delay in relation to the 14-15 the priority report? Yeah, I think we, we have established, I, mean, I, th I, I think by the way targets are a really good thing and, and, and challenging officials and departments and so on to achieve targets is a really good thing. I think we have my own view and I, I will be engaging ministers <coughs> in this and I, they may take a different view so just to, to, just to say that this is my view is that we have perhaps created something that is quite elaborate and complex with a very large number of targets. And I haven't seen, looking around at some of the other really effective players at a regional level in Europe, I haven't seen that level of complexity. So uh, one of the big themes in Brussels at the moment is simplification. And I'm interested in the idea of trying to, going forward, to simplify our European priorities a wee bit perhaps reduce the number of targets, and I'm not trying to do that to, to wriggle out of things or whatever, but I think we have an awful lot of targets that are there about just kind of bean counting targets, you know, about um, how many uh, meetings did we have or whatever. And for me, again, the issue here is about quality of engagement, you know, and, and the numbers are important and they are an indicator of activity and so on, but, you know, you could have one 
um, Horizon 2020 project that transforms this region economically and you know you could have a thousand others that never lead to anything so we, ha we have to get a balance here between uh, quantity and quality and I, I will be trying uh, and engaging with other stakeholders now to actually value the views of the committee okay. as to perhaps techniques or tactics that we could so, use to so try to accelerate it. I think that, that's encouraging that you're going to take that forward. You can't be more specific in terms of what is causing the delay in, on the report for the EU priorities in 2014-15. Well, simply there, there are a lot of returns to obtain from a lot of departments right. and so uh, the, the okay. part of the issue is that the figures that we collect and collate have to be verified and the verification okay. can take some time. Do you have an expected date for publication? Um, we, 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 I, I'm loath to give you a date, other than that I would say this, that we continue to press and encourage and cajole. Um, I, I found myself tied quite a bit in, in Brussels for a number of reasons uh, over the last few months, but one of the things that I found that it's incredibly important for me to do uh, um, within OFM, DFM is to engage much, much more with other departments, to build closer relationships with other departments and to try to use that to find ways to accelerate. In other words, knowing the person who can help accelerate uh, something that has become stuck in the system can be okay. quite important. Do you have an expected date for the publication of the EU priorities for 15-16? That, that will depend on a number of factors, one of the most important of which is, is whether or not this committee is content with what we've got at the moment. Um, but if uh, the committee is content, I will want to accelerate that through the system as quickly as I can. I understand that the process involves it going, first of all, to ministers in OFM, DFM, first, first ministers, and then on to the executive. Um, so again, I can influence, but I can't control. I will do my utmost to influence and to shape things so that that goes through quickly. I don't want to give you a, a, a promise, particularly, you know, there, there are uncertainties around. Okay, well, hopefully that will be a prompt process for you. You, you touched upon uh, the serious refugee crisis uh, that is uh, getting more severe uh, by the day. And uh, obviously the European Commission President Juncker has announced plans for a, a swift, determined and comprehensive response to the crisis. Can I ask um, what action is being taken in, in Brussels on these issues on, on behalf of the Northern Ireland Executive? Yeah, um, well, the, the, the refugee issue is, is, um, is certainly one that's being felt very strongly in Brussels, and you couldn't be, uh, even within the city itself, there are a large number of refugees turning up, and the Belgian authorities are struggling to, you know, to manage the situation. Uh, it's nowhere like as difficult as it is in Hungary, Greece and, and Italy, which are the three main countries affected. In terms of the Northern Ireland position, um, the Office of the First Minister and Deputy First Minister are seized of this issue. They recognise it's an issue where the Home Office is in the lead and the UK obviously will take its position as a member state as to, to what extent it wants to contribute to tackling the problem. But I do know that there is significant activity within my department at the moment on that issue. Um, and that uh, uh, interdepartmental engagement is going on in relation to how that will be handled. In terms of the Brussels contribution to that, um, I've been asked to look at whether or not there are any valuable models we could learn from elsewhere in Europe <laughs> by engagement with some of the, the regions that we know best over there to see if there's anything that we could pick up by way of a model to do something well or to do something better. And, and I will be exploring that. It's relatively recent work. Uh, um, but but we, we will be getting into that and trying to contribute, if we possibly can, something to that. It isn't an, er an area or an issue that the office that I'm aware of has been particularly involved in before, so we're breaking new ground with that. Um, but I, I, do, I do hope that if we can come up with something valuable, we'll feed that through to the folk in OFM, DFM who are working on these issues. Yeah, First no. Minister and Deputy First Minister are extremely keen to respond constructively uh, on, the, on the problem. I think most of us would agree that we have a moral obligation to, to do so, and I think it's encouraging to hear that there is uh, 
work being done across the levels of government. I think local government, regional government here, national government, as you mentioned, through the Home Office and linkage with Europe are going to be vital to ensure that we respond as quickly and effectively as, and as compassionately as we possibly can. Um, I think members want to ask supplementaries in relation to that. Bronwyn, no. you want to come in? No? Different question? Okay. Does anybody else want to argue on the comment? Thank you, Chair. Uh, thanks, Chair. Uh, Chair. Um, I mean, obviously, it is a big area of, of, of responsibility and certainly concern, more so nowadays, to a lot of people. But, and I'm just conscious that the Department has also, particularly for the First Minister, on a number of occasions, have made interventions around asylum seekers here on behalf of a number of asylum seekers here whose cases were brought to public and political attention. And there are obviously local structures here, there are asylum uh, seekers here, there are asylum seeker support groups. So, and appreciate your saying that the department is involved, has a lot of activity ongoing at the moment around the whole issue of the re refugee crisis. So I just wanted to underscore the point that certainly to uh, make sure the department uh, would still be in contact, maybe even need to, if needs to be, redouble our efforts with the existing refugees that we have here at the moment. They are seeking asylum, don't have asylum sorted out and so on. And as I've said, the department does support <coughs> some of those organisations. So just to make sure that we support that, what we have here, with the gift of support currently, as well as redoubling our efforts uh, more at the Brussels. I also appreciate your, your comments on that. I'll take that back to the officials that are in the leading on that, make sure they're aware of that concern then. Okay, members, I might do this while we uh, safe numbers here. Um, I think this, given the urgency and the seriousness of uh, the refugee crisis issue, um, I'm going to propose that we would write to uh, the department to request detail of action and uh, that's been taken with the UK government by OFMDFM on these issues. Uh, and also, you may recall that 80% of respondents to the consultation on the racial equality strategy felt that it should be a, a separate strategy for the refugee integration strategy. Um, so I'm proposing that in that correspondence we also uh, inquire as to whether there is to be a separate refugee integration strategy, what progress has been made in that, and whether it would be expedited given the seriousness of the current crisis. Uh, the committee also heard in March that the racial equality strategy would be developed over the summer, uh, so I would propose that in that correspondence we would also seek an update with regard progress that has been made and time scale for completion on that strategy. Are members content that we write to the first but, Deputy First Minister but, in those terms? Well, certainly, uh, Trevor, could we actually add some to the fact of could the Department liaise with current refugees or asylum seeking organisations? In, in an ideal world, an appropriate level. Uh, yeah, I'm sure we'd like to think officials working on those issues will be extremely busy at the moment. But uh, perhaps even if they have availability to update us in, in detail in, in person, it would be useful to hear from them as well. Members agreed on that. Okay, uh, Bronwyn, do you want to uh, ask a question as well? Just yep. on a separate issue, and we'll come on through on and Duna and. Um, I've dealt with yourself before, Andrew, in terms of your farming background, and it's obviously coming through there in your you new brief. Just, just can't let it go. You. I know, I know, but I'm, I'm just curious. You know, in in your old background, the farming background, have you learned any lessons? Did you learn any lessons regarding EU drawdown in terms of funding um, that could maybe be brought forward here in, in your new brief? Yeah. In particular, Ireland. Yeah. Who have an excellent reputation? There were there were huge um, lessons in Dard about engaging and how you engage with the European institutions, especially the Commission. Uh, you know, agriculture really we got into trouble over financial correction, and a lot of my time in agriculture was spent trying to bring down the amount of financial correction, which we had some success in that, and we saved probably tens of millions of pounds that would otherwise have been lost out of the budget. Um, but uh, the lessons out of it were go early and get in there early and talk to the people and don't assume that you'll just be able to wriggle out of it. You have to actually take on and, and confront the issues as soon as you can. And there were certainly um, in, in those days enormous lessons to, for me from Sweden, who were faster than I was off the mark 
in terms of sorting out some very similar issues, and they, they, they got it resolved more quickly. So, you, you, you know, there, there are lessons for any department handling structural funds, for example, from the agriculture experience. And I've already, you know, informally, as I engage with <coughs> colleagues in, in other departments, I talk about those experiences and I talk about the risks that there are if you don't sort out what the auditors are asking for and so on. So those are areas where we can sort of work hard to be ahead of the game and to make sure that we don't waste any of the structural funds that we get given to us through, you know, corrections and money being drawn back. And, and if, I, if I could add, I mean, that, that is the day job of, of the liaison officers, if you like, on the ground, that transfer of knowledge of what somebody else is doing that's good, best practice. Perfect. It's the building of the alliances, which is huge and important to us, building the networks, awareness of others, who's in this group, who's, who's really good at this, what can we learn from them, and collaboration is the delivery of, of the funding, which is extremely important, nobody would deny that, but also of, of, of consolidating our position as a region where people want to work with us as well. Okay. Uh, uh, did you want to ask another question? I yeah. did, Chair. Thank you. It's yeah. just, a, and I mean, you just referred to the end of your remarks there, Andrew, in terms of the whole milk crisis and all the rest. And are we satisfied that we're our support over there for the ministers going over? And I know it has been doing good work there to try to address some of the current issues around the, the agricultural and agri food industry and all the rest. Of that. So, are we happy enough that the support is there necessary to support the ministers? I think so now. Um, we, we've, I was with Michelle O'Neill. She's been with us now two weeks running, and she's been engaging very intensively on, on, on the issues to do with the dairy uh, sector. I personally worked very hard on that for her, uh, uh, because sometimes it's a small office, and the staff that we have there, if somebody's on leave, somebody else will step in and will do the work, and we, we, we collaborate like, the, like that, and, and we did for that event. I, th I think it went well for her, and I thought... She got the chance to put her messages across very clearly and very well at the different levels. It was a challenging um, situation because the the the, uh, the options that the Commission was wanting to contemplate were, were more limited than than our minister would have liked. Uh, but but the points were put across, and the, in particular, I think the Commissioner Commissioner Hogan understood very clearly the unique situation that farmers here in this region are facing because of the exchange rate difficulties and also because of the proportion of um, milk that is exported as powder and so on. Very special sets of circumstances. Uh, David McElveen. Yeah, thanks, Chair. And it's uh, first of all, welcome, Andrew, to your post, and it's good to see you again as well. Um, just kind of a supplementary to that, I mean, is, is there any work ongoing? I mean, obviously, one of the contributors to the crisis that we find ourselves in at the minute has been around the, the sanctions in Russia, and it certainly has played its part, as you will, as you will know. Um, I, I've spoken informally to some <coughs> officials um, in the embassy over there in, in London to, to sort of try and, I guess, get them to understand how devolution actually works. Yeah. in that you know, we have no power in Northern Ireland over foreign policy, so we are effectively being punished for something that we can't change. And I wonder, is there anything going on in Europe to try to explain that as well? When it does come to foreign visits or to reaching out to countries outside of Europe that we do business with and that we trade with, is there a program, is there a structure in place that is there to sort of try and explain to foreign countries that don't maybe know how Northern Ireland functions, what we can, what we can't do, and where perhaps special circumstances should be considered? Um, whether the government's ultimately at a sovereign level decide to do it or not is up to them, but I think it's important that we're at least getting that message across to ensure that they actually know how the United Kingdom works. Yes, and I think you, 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 there, there is, in a sense, a mechanism to do that. And one of the primary mechanisms has to be a kind of a pincer movement, nearly, where uh, both, if it's a Euro another European country, the engagement can certainly happen in Brussels, and you know, we, we would have mechanisms to access <coughs> other countries if we needed to talk to them about particular issues. Of course, Russia is, is, isn't a member of the EU, so you're, you're in a different ball game there. Um, but we can sort of feed in views and concerns, for example, in relation to how the EU is taking decisions in the Ukraine. Uh, now, w w the other dimension to that is going w where there are issues in Belfast and where the devolved administration has issues, it needs to go through the, the relevant, whatever lead department there is in the member state to make sure that 
that that's being maximised as well as a conduit, because ultimately a member state carries a lot more weight than any region will ever do. You know, there are over 80 regions with offices in Brussels, and you know, the, the, the institutions want to deal with a smaller number. They want to deal with 28 member states max, <laughs> and uh, uh, until new ones join, of course. <laughs> But uh, so, so I think it's about working informally sometimes. I don't think you can be too formal about it, and just building that understanding and, and using the networking that Brussels provides to engage. I don't know yes. even the examples. No, certainly. Or I mean, that... you're perfectly right. It's through member state level, but the opportunities on the ground for members of the office and the liaison officers to speak to our UGREP, the UK <laughs> representation, and try and uh, feed into them information about well, we have a view on this, or we feel that that's maybe not being raised, and perhaps yes, it's coming from. Uh, the devolved administration to Westminster, but nothing beats speaking to the first secretary sitting around the table and saying, you really need to think about this and we want to know what happened or we really would like you to make an intervention. All done very diplomatically, I, of course. <laughs> but yes, lots of opportunities to speak to other regions, collaborations with the other devolved administrations, maybe when we have a view on something and perhaps it coincides with Scotland or Wales, uh, other member states that would have a friendly view lots of opportunities in that, what I referred to earlier, this alliance building of bringing it together and getting the value of people sitting in Brussels on the ground. Yeah. I, mean, I, I get inquiries sometimes, for example, from maybe from a minister wanting to know if I took the following action, mm -hmm. would, would that be a good thing or, thing, you know, or, or indirectly through the officials and so on. And I can take stock with other regions where I know that that has happened yeah. and get back and say, well, if you're going to go down that road, could you if you do it like this, don't do it like that, because otherwise yeah. it'll fail. Mm -hmm. And there are ways and means of making a communication a better one than it would otherwise be. One of the most important things of all, and it's what, it'll be something I'll be preaching sort of any, every time they, they, they allow me to speak, um, but the more we can work together in terms of you know, m knowing what ministers are, 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 are being aware of ministers' engagement in Europe and be able to support them, the better. Uh, because sometimes it's very, very easy, and other regions experience this too, for, for messages to go across purposes, and it just leaves the Commission officials, say, scratching their heads uh, in confusion because they're expecting to get a single clear message. You know, so that's just something we have to keep working at. You know, because silos exist everywhere; they're not just in this in this region. But but, but I think it's something we'll be doing battle on for some time. Okay. The Northern Ireland European Regional Forum is obviously an important body to try and integrate our approach to Europe and avoid silo mentality. Is it possible to give us an update on your engagement with the European Regional Forum? Yes, I, um, I, I have been in, certainly have been engaging about the, that forum. I haven't actually engaged with it yet. Uh, I know that others in the department who are responsible for the future of that forum and so on are engaging with stakeholders. Uh, councils and so on, just about quite how that will be taken forward, okay. uh, and I don't think anything has been decided at this point in time. But okay. certainly, you know, if, if that forum carries on, uh, it's it would be on my agenda to, to 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 meet with and to engage with the forum at some point in the not too distant future. It, it's just things seem to be uncertain at the moment. Okay. And is there any significant update in relation to the the Peace Four program? Yes, uh, the, the peace work on, is ongoing on, on Peace 4. There's been a great deal of engagement and a great deal of progress. The Commission had uh, fed back its, its views and considerations on what had been developed so far, and that required then further work. So the engagement is intensive across, across the border and also uh, among the various players, the Department of Finance and Personnel and the lead, Dell, and also the Managing Authority, SEUPB. So uh, there's been a great deal of activity and work on that front, with a view to getting that programme uh, cleared and in place by the end of the year at the latest, if possible. Okay. Well, any other questions, members? No. Andrew, Una, thank you very much indeed for uh, being with us today, and hopefully we'll have some more detailed updates and progress on, on those reports in the, the near future <coughs> as your work continues. So thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, Chair. Members, Andrew mentioned a committee response to the executive's EU priorities for 2015-16. Uh, do members want to review 
the draft priorities that are in your pack today and uh, hopefully next week be able to come back uh, with uh, detailed uh, responses in relation to that that the committee can then formally respond. Great. Okay. Uh, are members also content to circulate Appendix 3 on page 137, which details departmental engagement with Assembly Committees on European Matters to September 2014, along with the European policy dossiers to the relevant statutory committees? Great. Members, before we move on, you will also recall um, we earlier in the year we set out our own European priorities, and these included labour mobility, the European Agenda on Migration and EU Accession to the European Convention on Human Rights. Are members content to ask Assembly Research for an update on the Committee's own European priorities for 2015? Agreed. Okay. Then members, our next agenda item is item 9, a departmental briefing on the final good relations indicators. There was a commitment within the Together Building a United Community strategy to review the good relations indicators which had been developed originally to monitor progress under a shared future and the racial equality strategy. Consultation ran from January to March 2014 and the committee was briefed on the outcome of the consultation in June last year. In May of this year, officials briefed the committee on progress on Together Building a United Community, and in subsequent follow-up correspondence, officials provided the revised version of the Good Relations Indicators, which had been finalised in April 2015. There are a number of papers in your packs today. These are the clerk's brief at page 331, a final version of the Good Relations Indicators at page 33. I would like to welcome then our uh, officials today. Uh, I think we have Gronje Killen, uh, Pauline Donnan, Peter Robinson and Donna Blaney with us. You're all very welcome. Thank you very much indeed for being here today. Would you like to make uh, opening remarks before we move to questions? Um, yes. Thank you very much, Deputy Chairperson, okay. for the invitation to appear here today to brief the committee on the final set of Good Relations Indicators. Um, as you've said, you've all received a written copy of the indicators on the 11th of June, and these were briefly discussed uh, at your meeting on the 17th. The, the Together Building a United Community strategy <coughs> sets out a range of actions and commitments for government departments, communities and individuals who work together to build a united community and achieve change against four strategic priorities. Our children and young people, our shared community, our safe community and our cultural expression. There was a commitment within the strategy to review the existing set of good relations indicators. OFM DFM led the review with the assistance of an advisory group comprising internal and external stakeholders. The indicators were consulted on between the 22nd of January and 31st of March 2014. The committee received a copy of the responses to the consultation document and officials attended the committee meeting on the 11th of June 2014 to discuss the indicators. In total, there were 54 respondents to the consultation. 28 organisations participated. Uh, feedback on each of the 21 indicators was very positive, with at least two thirds of respondents agreeing that each of the indicators chosen were suitable. For 10 of the indicators, at least 90% of the respondents indicated they were suitable. Respondents were also given the opportunity to provide more detailed comments about the indicators, and as a result of the consultation exercise, some changes were made. Under the key priority, our shared community, one of the indicators measured the percentage of people living in segregated areas, that is, areas where at least 90% of residents are from one community background. The data source for this indicator is the census of, census of population. The census is only carried out every 10 years, so perhaps not very helpful for monitoring purposes. <laughs> to resolve this, we have included an indicator using data from the Housing Condition Survey, namely the percentage of people who see the area where they live in as segregated. The Housing Condition Survey is run approximately every two years, so it will be possible to see changes over time more regularly. Also, under our shared community, an indicator has been added to who would prefer to send their children to a mixed religion school. This was as a result of comments from the consultation exercise to include an indicator on parents' preferences for sharing in education. The consultation also found a high level of support for the inclusion of an indicator on integrated education as well as shared education. So indicators on the percentage of applications to post-primary integrated schools that do not result in admissions and the percentage of pupils enrolled in integrated education will also be monitored. 
Uh, under our safe community, an indicator on peace walls has been added. As respondents to the consultation suggested, an indicator looking at interfaces should be included. The indicator uses data from the Attitudes to Peace Walls survey and monitors the percentage of people who would like to see peace walls come down now or in the near future. The views of both local residents and the general population will be measured. Uh, ministers approved a final good relations indicator on the 22nd of April. Uh, the good relations indicator framework will be used to monitor progress at a population level. It will also provide the strategic performance management framework that will underpin the measurement of impacts for the strategy's headline actions associated programmes and funding streams. Work is currently underway to develop the first report detailing baseline and historic statistics from the indicators. This is due to be published on the 22nd of September 2015. Uh, thanks for the opportunity to update you and my colleagues here will be happy to take any questions you may have. Thanks very much indeed. Uh, Ronya, as you've mentioned, the good relation indicators were finalised on, on April 2015. Is there any reason why it took so long to advise the committee on finalisation of them? Um, I honestly don't know why it took so long. Um, uh, apologies. OK, OK. Um, the final version, has it been made available to all stakeholders? Um, and what type of response have you received? Yeah, I understand that it has been made available. Absolutely. It's been made available to the stakeholders who are involved in the advisory group, um, but it hasn't been um, published yet. But as Gronje mentioned, we are developing the, the first report of the indicators, and this will be published on the 22nd of September. OK, so that will be the, the first opportunity for people to engage with the new indicators in, in that report. And actually see what the indicators are telling us in terms of trends and what the current position is. OK. Um, the question about young people socialising together appears to be removed from key priority one, our children and young people. Was there any particular reason for that? Um, Yes, this was because the, the indicator was actually so similar to the other one about them um, participa participating in sports, etc., that it was taken out because really it was just it was coming from the same question, so that had been an oversight um, okay. in the consultation process. Okay, and um, you obviously mentioned there has been a question included about peace walls in key priority three. Uh -huh. um, could you say a wee bit more about the rationale for that? particular question? Um, I suppose the rationale behind it was originally we had thought about measuring the actual number of peace walls that, uh, that are up at the moment, but it was felt that that wasn't very meaningful and it would be more helpful to have something on actually hearts and minds and people's views as to whether they were ready to see peace walls come down or not. So that, that was the rationale behind including something that also um, has been the survey has been carried out once and again, but the, the results aren't actually publicly available yet. So we already have an idea of the, the trends in that, and hopefully we can carry that out again in the future. And could you could you just say a, a bit more about how exactly the the data is going to be collected um, for the report? In, ter in terms of how the information in response to the question the surveys are going to be drawn, and from where? In general, yeah, for all yeah. of the indicators. Yeah, uh -huh. Um, a lot of them are from the Young, uh, the Young Life and Times survey and the Northern Ireland Life and Times survey, which are attitudinal um, surveys that are run every year. So that will give us feedback on an annual basis. Uh, we also are getting information from PSNI in terms of hate crime stats and from the Housing Executive in terms of intimidation and also from the Housing Conditions Survey as to um, feelings about whether the area they live in is mixed or not. So there's quite a wide range of, of different sources. And the information in relation to schools will that be drawn direct from Education yeah, Authority absolutely. then? Yeah. yeah, the Department of Education can provide that. OK. Uh, some of the feedback that we received during our inquiry into building a united community mentioned uh, a, a disconnect from the good relations in district councils in terms of them being quite high level and, and difficult for district councils to 
to measure and to connect to some of the programs that that they are engaged in in the regional good relations program. Um, how would you respond to that particular concern? Well, one of the things that we want to do with the indicators, and we're starting to put in place at the moment, is it's very much going to be used as an overarching framework to underpin monitoring and evaluation for Good Relations funded programmes, including the District Council Good Relations uh, programme itself. So the idea behind that is that we will be working with the councils to help them develop the outcomes and indicators, um, depending on what projects they'll be running within their council areas, very much taking an outcomes-based accountability approach, but linking it up to this sort of higher level strategic uh, indicator framework. So I take the point that for some of the indicators, really, they, they make sense to the Northern Ireland level, but they will translate themselves down um, in a different format, if you like, at district council level or local level. And you'll be working closely with good relations officers around outcomes-based approach at council level then, yeah? Yeah, in okay. fact, um, I've been asked to give a presentation at the District Council Good Relations Programme Conference at the start of October. So we'll be talking to them about outcomes-based accountability. I think that was another key feedback in our inquiry, the opportunities for the District Council Good Relations Officers to coordinate and convene together more regularly outside of just the annual conference as well. So it would be uh, encouraging if if it went beyond the, the conference, yeah. but uh, and encouraging yeah. to hear that you will be taking an opportunity at the upcoming conference to relate the, the indicators to council level programmes as well. Absolutely. Do you want to say? Yes, Chair, if I could just add, um, in addition to the annual conference, we have started a series of four um, annual or four uh, uh, shared learning forums with district councils um, so that we can, people are more advanced, they can learn from others, share good practice and include um, the delivery of uh, the programmes on an EA approach. So it's like a good step in the right direction. Well, the first one is later on this month. Good job. Uh, another piece of feedback from the inquiry was around um, clearer working definitions on, on some of the terminology used in, in TBOC and uh, in the indicators. Uh, is that something you're taking into consideration and responding to? Yeah, it was within the, the indicator, certainly in the report that will be published later on this month, um, we included a, a section which is called metadata, which is quite a statistical term, I suppose. But really, all that tells you is um, about the source and about the definitions and how exactly the questions are asked and what we mean by the questions and the terminology used. So um, I would hope that, that that will resolve the issue with regard to definitions and provide a bit more clarity. OK. And then in terms of the, the first report, uh, expected at the end of September, will it make express connection with the headline actions in the Building a United Community Strategy, or, or will there be a, a separate interim evaluation of the United, Building a United Community Strategy in due course? No, it doesn't. The report doesn't specifically link to the headline actions, but um, we have been working with the, the various departments who are responsible for the headline actions to help them develop an outcomes-based accountability approach and to identify the good relations outcomes that they will be achieving through those headline actions and also identifying how then they link up to this higher level strategic indicator framework. So it will all be connected, but not specifically in the indicator report to be published at the end of September. Okay, and are, is there any plan to draw together the departmental outcome-based approach on the headline actions in building a United Community Strategy then? Um, well, I think the intention is really to be able to look at each of the, the key priorities within TBUC and look at the sort of the popula population level strategic indicators and what that's telling us, but also then looking down below that and looking at what the outcomes the headline actions have, the good relations funded programmes have, district council, etc., etc. And because we have identified this outcomes framework and each project or programme has to identify with with one or or, or more of them, we'll be able to, to be able to say what the impacts are on the ground or through those specific headline actions. I suppose we're over two years on from publication of 
the building a united community strategy so it, it would be good in the near future to to get detailed feedback and reporting on what impact it, it is having at this point and i think there is a challenge given that the actions do stretch across all if not a number of government departments um, i'm not uh, obviously ofm dfm have a lead role in relation to it and this committee therefore feels a lead role i'm not quite sure what monitoring or engagement other statutory committees are, are having with their relevant departments on the you know on the key headline issue so um I would hope that somewhere in the near future there will be some form of interim evaluation or interim reporting in relation to it, and um, indeed maybe more detail around action action plans, overarching action plans as well. So perhaps that's something we can return to with you. Uh, I think Alec Maskey wanted to ask a yeah, question as well. Yeah. Me, thank you for your presentation so far. I was just curious as to how the. Um with the transfer of functions and change of departments so on uh, for next year in the local government, how that may imp impact on either policy or funding or some sense of uniformity. I know that area by area, or council area by council area, there may be some differences, but there are core principles which we need to be adhered to. And given our past experience in local councils, they haven't been up to mark, let's be frank about it. So I know you're addressing, Pauline, you're saying you're addressing the uh, officers later on in the year, but do you see any potential impact in a negative way or a positive way for that matter, hopefully, with the uh, change in some of the department structures for next year, in terms of how that made an impact on the board? Well, I suppose my responsibility is in terms of monitoring and evaluation. I'm not sure if it's been thought about in, in, in relation to the policy. If you could, could we talk maybe just specifically in relation to the district councils, in that um, OFMD them fund them three million pounds per yep. year, and a million pounds is match funded by the councils. But um, and that the uh, the principle behind that is to deliver local yes. solutions to local issues because there's no one size fits all in good relations. However, the process through which we um, award that money is very um, a strict process of the councils put forward uh, a proposed action plan, and that's scored and assessed with people from outside the department as well to make sure it's fully aligned with the delivery of the principles of the strategy and you know sticking to the four or shared or safe or children young people expression and so hopefully we will be here in, in terms of um, the change for the department of communities and OFM DFM the current plan is that the policy will stay within OFM DFM and the delivery would go to the Department of Communities, so there still will be a function within yeah. OFM DFM to set that scene yeah. and ensure fidelity of the strategy is in all our funding streams. Yeah, just because I mean, just to uh, impress upon that, I mean, I think it's important that that is the case because there are, as you say, maybe different variations of strategy being applied locally, but there are core principles. Yep. And there has to be an overall an overarching strategy. So I just came to have an assurance that the department will have oversight of that. I think that's it. why these good relations indicators setting up overall performance framework are very important <laughs> and useful in that respect. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Okay, folks, uh, would it be possible to send details of the, the District Council Good Relations uh, Conference? That is coming up in the near future um, and what uh, format will the report be published at the end of September will it be um, will there be a, a ministerial statement in the assembly or is it on the website what what way will it be distributed be published on on the UFM DFM website <laughs> in the way that we publish all of our official statistics um, and it's in the form of a report which clearly demonstrates trends over time and then there there are um, tables accompanying that uh, where you can go and find out a lot more about the data if you so wish okay can that be sent to the committee as well yeah okay Okay, well, thanks very much indeed. Um, look forward to seeing you again in the future, hopefully. Thank you. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, members, uh, agenda item 10 then is any other business? Do members wish to raise any other items at the committee today? No. Okay. <laughs> the
optimistic date, time and location of the next meeting is next Wednesday, 16th of September, 2pm in room 30. Thank you. Committee room 30.